Hello. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's uh, quite a privilege and quite an honor to be invited to this festival, uh, partly because Dingle itself has a, a really warm memory in my heart. Um, I worked here for four years, actually, for uh, Don Bluth from 1990 to 1994, and my parting gift was a trip out here to the Kerry Peninsula, and we stayed here in Dingle. And, and so, anyway, it's very, very nice to return. So, I was asked to give a little talk about my career, starting from college all the way to where I am now, and knowing that most of you in the room are students, um, I, I want to save some time for questions at the end of it. And uh, it's going to be a little low-tech. I don't have any visuals to show you. I'm just going to impart some, uh, some uh, cautionary tales and bits of wisdom and a perspective coming into it from somebody much like yourselves who had a lot of ambition and passion and not a lot of experience in the industry. So to start with, um, much like many of you, I, uh, I just love to draw. And as a kid, as I was growing up, I was inspired by comic books and I was inspired by movies. Uh, but I, I grew up in a little town in Quebec, Canada, where uh, Hollywood and New York City, where DC and Marvel were, they just seemed very far away. Um, but the work that was created by the comic book companies and by Hollywood had inspired me in such a way that my imagination was on fire. And whether it was with action figures in the backyard or um, sitting with pencil and paper coming up with my own stories and plotting out my own comic books, I was determined to find a way to do this for a living. I had no idea how to get there. Uh, so it was always the question, like, how do I get to contribute? How do I get to be part of this, this great tradition of of storytelling, just being so inspired by it myself. So uh, as I was finishing up high school, I, a guidance counselor had told me about a college in Canada called Sheridan College that taught an animation program. And I didn't know much about animation. I was fascinated by it, but I didn't know much. And I decided I would give it a shot. So I joined an international summer school of animation and found myself in a group of students that came from everywhere, from Egypt, and Norway, uh, a few from China, and like, everybody, and all these talented folks who were all driven by one passion, which was to, to be the author of their own creations. And college was an amazing experience in that we were taught to just broaden our reach and try everything. You know, we would, we would storyboard our own concepts all the way through to working with the sound and editing it together. Animation, there was no restriction on medium or style, it was just uh, the end goal was to try to create something that would go out there into the world and represent who you were and what you wanted to do. And it was very freeing. Every, every teacher that we had seemed to be about freeing our minds and, and rounding us out as artists as much as possible. But there was one professor in particular, his name was Zach Schwartz, and his career went all the way back to Snow White. He had worked for Disney in the early days painting backgrounds. And he had become one of our teachers. He taught story at Sheridan College. And in particular, the lessons that he left with me, uh, I carry with me to this day because I found them to be 100% true. Um, one of them, he was, he was you know, a bit of a taskmaster, and he really cracked the whip on us. But he said, when you get out there, as soon as you land your first job, do not be a clock watcher. And he was very, very emphatic about that. He said, you have years and years to make up for. You've got terrible drawings. You've got terrible work techniques. You have to earn a reputation. You're not going to be gifted it. And so he just meant, don't be watching for 6 PM and, and the moment that you can sort of clock out and go home. Uh, he, he just said, you have to sink every moment you can into pursuing this if you want to be somebody who's sought out and who has a reputation that precedes you. So don't be a clock watcher. The second thing that he, he said over and over again is he said, you have to aspire to be the one that they cannot fire. So there is a wave uh, of, of layoffs that will come every few years in every part of the world's animation industry and filmmaking industry where you know, projects will boom and they'll hire and then things will settle and they'll start letting people go. And when that team goes from 300 people to 50 people or 20 people, you have to aspire to be one of the ones that can't afford to let go. Um, which means being well-rounded, being dependable, 
being exceedingly talented and as best you can, you know, to be the most valuable person around you. Um, so that was always, that always stuck with me as well. And it's certainly something that I would impart to all of you. The last thing that he said was a bit of creative advice. And I always think that this is worthwhile uh, because it, it applies to every pursuit, every artistic pursuit, whether it's music, screenwriting, fine art, painting, storytelling. Um, it is this. If it reads as a postage stamp, it will read as a billboard. Kind of a simple thing to keep in mind about looking for the strong, bold, simple statement that when you start adding all of your detail onto will, will define the artistic piece. And uh, anyway, it, I, always, I always try to remember it, um, whether I'm working on a story or a piece of art. I can't play music, but I can see the same applies to people who play music. You're always looking for the strong, the bold statement. The, the memorable takeaway, and upon that you can um, throw all of the decoration you want to, but at least it will have a strong uh, shape, a strong, a strong skeleton. So moving from there, uh, coming out of college, I landed my first job working for a TV animation studio in Canada. And it was a beloved TV series called The Raccoons, but you know, very limited in its animation. And I very quickly went from art school where everything was possible um, to suddenly very compartmentalized, put into a box, and feeling a little bit undermined. Uh, because once it was sort of the cold slap of the industry, especially when you're entering at a ground level job, uh, you are not sort of valued as the artist you were, you were being groomed to be in school. You're kind of very much put into a box and say, this is what you do, this is all you do, this is your contribution, and uh, be happy with it. You're lucky to have a job. And it really didn't sit well with me because I had aspirations to tell stories and, and eventually you know, I, I could see that directing and screenwriting and being at the front end was something that I wanted. But of course I was starting like, I was, I was an, uh, an assistant animator, an in-betweener in classical animation. And so it was gonna be years before I'd get to animate and years beyond that before I would have a chance to really steer the ship. So it, that was a little bit of a harsh reality, but it helped me pay the bills and got me through school. And as soon as I finished my third year, I was hired to work at the Sullivan Bluth Studios in Dublin. I was 20 years old. I moved out here knowing no one and uh, quickly made friends here with the, a lot of the, the students and the young Irish animation workforce that had been employed by the Sullivan Bluth Studios. And it was an amazing time. Um, but the real takeaway from my four years at the Don Bluth Studios was that there were so many talented, passionate people who wanted to make something great. And it really felt good to be part of a team that was an underdog. You know that Disney was already established, but they were kind of, you know, their last films were, when I joined, were Oliver and Company. You know, and Don Bluth Studios had just come out with All Dogs Go to Heaven. So there was a sense of like, they were reaching, they were striving and creatively stronger here than they were at Disney. And uh, I came in with that excited spirit. But what I quickly realized is that the, the people at the top, namely Don Bluth, had lost confidence in their artists. There was almost a contempt, actually. You could feel it. And so that there was the frustration of knowing you're surrounded by talented people, knowing that people really want to make a difference and put something out into the world that is indelible, and feeling the squeeze of the, the, the control, uh, creative control, that was exerted from the top. Um, there was no room to sort of express yourself or really grow, uh, especially in the storytelling realm, which was the realm that I was most interested in. And so there was a lot of frustration. There were a lot of you know, big decisions being made in terms of the storytelling in somewhat incompetent hands. Um, and there was a sense that, that you, there was the forbidden Story, storyboarding was forbidden. That was kind of controlled by Don Bluth itself. The CG department, which you know, was really just kind of up and coming in 1990 to 1994, was also somewhere where, I, I, mean, I remember sticking my head in a few times and asking questions about how things were done and essentially, you know, lit figuratively having the door slammed in my face, like, you go draw your drawings, this is what we do. Um, I walked into a storyboard office, uh, storyboarder's office once and I was working in layout, and I asked him about the intention for the scene because he hadn't indicated any backgrounds in his storyboards. And I said, I'm gonna be working on the scene. 
um, do you have any ideas about you know, where you want it at stage? And he said, I'm sorry, who are you? And I said, Dean, I work in the layout department. He, he said, oh, okay, go lay out. And he, so there was this really weird sort of, there was the upper echelon, and they were very protective of their jobs. And then there were the rest of us who wanted to learn. So I learned to be a little bit more defiant during those days. I bought my first computer system, it was an Amiga, and it had Lightwave. And I started to teach myself CG animation in my bedroom at night. I went to a story structure course being offered in London by Robert McKee. And that was a light bulb moment where I thought, you don't need a degree. And you, you can really learn this stuff and you can try to not master storytelling as much as just learn about it and have respect for it and really be involved in it. Uh, that the only difference between a screenwriter and somebody who isn't is just buying a copy of Final Draft. <laughs> That's what I realized. So it started this defiant streak in me. And I began to feel as though I wanted to get myself away from Don Bluth and the control of the studio. And I began putting together a portfolio. Uh, one of the things that I worked on was I, I knew that I couldn't really include work from movies that I was working on. So I created a film uh, in my own head. And I started storyboarding. And I did layouts for it. I wrote the outline. And the whole thing was actually inspired by a trip to this very place, to Kerry. There's a beach just up the road called Slay Head. And it's this incredible beach where there's this old rusted ship wedged up on the rocks, very close to where they shot uh, Ryan's Daughter, the David Lean film. And so I created the story. It was called The Banshee and Finn McGee. And it was you know, entirely development. But I made my, my whole um, portfolio based on this. And I'd applied once to Disney, and I was rejected, and so I just went for broke. I put everything I could. I had character design, storyboards, the story itself, um, layouts, as much as I could just to show that I was a rounded artist with ideas of my own, and it worked. I got hired. So there was that, that sense that I, I needed to grow. I needed to move on, and I left in 1994 to join Disney. The lies that were spread about Disney, specifically from Don Bluth, were, um, were dis dispelled with immediately. He told me that if I ever went to Disney, I would be just a number. And you know, here at Don Bluth, you can, you can become you know, the artist you want to be, and we respect, and we promote, and we acknowledge young artists with passionate ideas. It was the opposite. So when I arrived there, I realized I was, I was now within a group of people who were as passionate and as talented uh, but had the room to actually have a voice and to affect stories and control and steer stories. I got absorbed into the, lay the, sorry, the storyboard department, even though I'd been hired as a layout artist. They weren't ready to go into production, so they gave me some uh, sequence to try me out on in storyboarding. And that's when I met Chris Sanders. Uh, Chris was another mentor, like Zach Schwartz, my, my um, Sheridan College professor. But Chris was a little bit more of a contemporary. He's 10 years older than I am, but he's, he's, uh, you'd think he's 10 years younger. He's just got so much energy. Um, he's like a big kid. He gets really excited about things, but he's extremely defiant as well. And all for the right reasons. Uh, he felt that uh, Disney was getting a little stagnated, and we were relying too much upon mediocre writers that they would hire from TV sitcoms and otherwise out of work and bring them in to write our stories. And those scripts were never very good. So it, uh, it, it was an interesting, Mulan took five years to make, and I was on the storyboard department for almost all five of it. I started as a, as a junior uh, storyboard artist. Halfway through, I became the head of story, taking over for Chris Sanders as he went off to develop something that he would direct, which eventually became Lilo and Stitch. So Chris was a, a, a defiant mentor, and I'll give you an example of that in a moment. I had one other mentor who lived next door, and he was uh, the exact opposite in terms of temperament. The kindest, most inviting uh, gentleman of a storyteller named Joe Grant. And Joe became my mentor until he passed away, like I think about 10 days before his 97th birthday. And he was a De Disney legend. He was there from, I think he started in 1933. He was there the day that Walt came in and said, I want to make a feature-length animated cartoon called <laughs> Snow White. So he was part of that discussion. And the legacy and the history and just being able to absorb these stories was amazing. Um, but Joe, the biggest takeaway from Joe was that 
he once again, so as the animation industry tries to put you in a box, he was trying to pull me out of it. He'd say, take a sculpting class, write, you know, get out there, do anything, pick up an instrument, be as rounded an artist as you can be because that's what this world is going to do to you. It's gonna to try to define you. You can do this one thing, and when that thing becomes obsolete, you're useless. And what a terrible you know, epiphany to find yourself with. So he was always, like he would stay up late watching Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, and, and he was always on top of, like for a, a guy who was 96 years old, like the sharpest tack in the room, really witty sense of humor, and he was always interested in what was coming next, and he loved the idea of CG animation. He was the one who was saying Walt would have loved this, because Walt was an innovator, and he loved anything that was going to advance the medium. So um, he was a terrific guy to have always there that I could, I could pitch stories to, and uh, he would bring in books, and he would just constantly um, push me to do, do um, anything outside of my day-to-day requirements, uh, working as a storyboard artist on Mulan, and then eventually when we moved into Lilo and Stitch. Now, uh, so, so he was sort of the gentlemanly, encouraging voice, and then you had Chris Sanders, who was the defiant, uh, fiery voice. And one example of that was, uh, oh, we had been working on Lilo and Stitch for, sorry, uh, we had been working on Mulan for about two years, and it was just spinning its wheels. The directors couldn't decide what movie they wanted to make. The producer was pushing for her own version. We had an editor who thought we were all idiots. And we had no less than eight writers who had come through the doors. And none of them could figure out how do we tell a story that the character is going to care about, that, that the audience will care about the character. And we went round and round. And for the longest time, Mulan was going to be about a girl who was trapped in a, a life of tradition and duty, and that the war provided an opportunity for her to escape it. It was always a self-fulfilling, a self self-motivated journey and ultimately came off as selfish. And Chris Sanders had always been arguing for, no, this needs, to be about a, this needs to be a story about a girl who, yes, doesn't fit in, but when the war conscription arrives at her doorstep and she knows that her father will have to go to war, that she does it because she loves him um, in the face of dishonor, and trouble and everything else it's going to invite to her life, that she loves him so much, she will sacrifice all of that for him. And, and it was that pivotal decision that changed the course of the story, uh, but it was met with great resistance. And so I just remember the day where Chris Sanders walked into the producer and he said, I'm about to go into that room and I'm going to land blast anything that gets in the way of a story doing this, of a, a story of a daughter doing this to save her father. I'm telling you that so you can either fire me or keep me out of the room. And, um, and the producer said, finally, you know, she was, she was so happy that somebody was going to take a stand, a very a defining stand. And, and we all got behind him. And it, it was messy, and, and there was yelling and screaming, and it was passionate, and it was kind of cool. But that's why Mulan became <laughs> the movie that it is. So I guess I realized that I'm, I'm a little bit more docile. I don't like confrontation but I realize there are moments where you do have to become a bit of a bully in order to, if, if the cause is worthwhile. The one thing that we, it, it sort of started this manifesto between Chris Sanders and I. We thought there are so many people at the helm here, all those people I just described, everyone has a creative say and no one has a weighted say and so it just, decisions don't get made. And we said if we ever get a chance to do this, if we ever get a chance to direct a movie, let's make sure we write it, let's make sure we storyboard it, let's make sure we work closely with an editor who sees things our way. And so for better or worse, it will become the movie that we intended it to be. And that was sort of built upon a, a, a bit of a lesson that I'd taken from Don Bluth, which is, if I ever get to do this, if I ever get to steer the ship, I want the crew to be proud of the accomplishment. Because that was one of the hardest things, is you watch people give up nights and weekends and sink so much of their passion into something that ultimately we were all embarrassed by. You know, I worked on a troll in Central Park, Thumbelina, and then the, a pebble and a penguin. And none of them I was proud to tell my family and friends that I'd worked on, which is really awful because I, that's four years of my life. And I thought, people don't work any less hard on a turd than they do on something really great. And I think ultimately the, the responsibility falls with the people steering the ship. So if I ever got to steer that ship, if I ever got to direct a movie, or write a movie, or both, that I would make sure that we, we not only enjoyed the process, but 
we were really proud of it at the end, that we could sit in a movie theater with our family and our friends and not feel embarrassed or have to apologize for all those delayed holidays and everything else, just to be able to say, I was part of that. And that's what Lilo and Stitch became for us. Uh, before I get to it, there's, there's also this sort of recognition, the one lesson I learned along the way is just the idea of a bad fit. I finished Mulan, as I said, taking over as head of story, and so my next assignment was to be head of story on another film, and that film was Atlantis. I joined the project because they had asked me to read their script and then comment on it, and I did. I read it. I could see that it wasn't really a story that I connected with, but I gave a lot of feedback saying, here's what I would do. Here's, these are characters that I would care about, and they seemed to respond favorably because they hired me. But the moment that I arrived on the job, they said, oh, and by the way, we're not changing a thing. This is the film we're making. It's all explosions. It's the characters that I said to them at one point, I said, well, you have you know, eight core characters, and we don't really care about any of them. You know, we should really spend some time developing these personalities. And I remember one of the directors said to me, Dean, this isn't that kind of story. <laughs> so they're very proud of their explosions and their, their you know, uh, I guess everything was a tribute to action movies of the past that they loved, but I felt very out of place. And it was gonna be a long few years. So I went to go talk to our president of production at Disney at the time, and I said, here's what's bugging me. I feel, I feel miscast over here, and yet over at Pixar they're making Monsters, Inc. And I said, I have a story that I could pitch to you, which is identical, almost identical. So I said, it's not as though the movies that I would feel connected to aren't out there. Um, I just, I, I feel like I've, I need to, I, I would rather quit this job and pursue something that I'm close to than to stay on and be miserable. And he said, well, I know that you've been spending your lunch times and evenings working with Chris on this little project of his called Lilo and Stitch. He said, we're going to need two directors to make it, so why don't you join him and go to Florida and make the film? And, and so, you know, every now and then, like, I would advise you just recognize your shortcomings and embrace those things that you are really good at and, and be certain about it, be defiant about it, come what may. So Lilo and Stitch was kind of a, it was an interesting chapter because finally we were in a position to deliver on our manifesto. How do we wear as many hats? Um, how do we make sure that, you know, we don't go through estranged uh, families and sickness and divorces and make a film that doesn't, uh, that is actually a celebration of the people that worked on it. So we made, we, we arrived in Florida and we got everyone together in a room much like this and we said, okay, we have less money and less time to make this quirky little film that is admittedly a risk for the studio, but they've decided that they're going to make a calculated risk and let us just uh, defy tradition a little bit and make a film that that doesn't feel particularly Disney, but at a much lower cost. So how do we do that without ruining ourselves? And how do we do that so that everyone can go home at night and have dinner with their families and have weekends? And we just, we kind of collectively made all these decisions where, well, we couldn't afford shadows. So almost all of Lilo and Stitch takes place under the shade of a tree or something like that. You know, we couldn't afford the pencil mileage of details. So we took pockets and, and designs off of t-shirts and, and we just did whatever we could to make it so that everybody's lives were gonna be easier because we were determined not to break backs and bring sickness into the mix. But it also allowed us, because we were in Florida, to go rogue a little bit and to be off the radar of Disney back in California. Um, they kept telling Chris Sanders and I that, yes, we know you've bought a copy of Final Draft and yes, we know that you're kind of tapping away at your own screenplay, just so you know, you guys, are artists, you draw pictures, you don't write, you don't have a screenwriting background, so we will be hiring real writers to come in, but you can play for a little while. And then time went by and they were distracted with the films they were making in California, and then all of a sudden the film was nearly done. And they looked at us and they realized they hadn't hired those screenwriters they had threatened to, to hire. And, uh, and they knew that bringing somebody in to the mix was probably going to change the very singular voice that it had. And so, begrudgingly, they let it be. And as the film was released, we were now professional screenwriters. So it's, it's a little bit, again, sort of pushing, being defiant and kind of pushing 
in the direction you want to go, and, and sometimes openings will just appear. Um, so we felt very confident. You know, the, the project went as we had hoped, and it was a success as it went out there. And the question was, what do you move on to next? And for me, I thought, well, I, in my own personal hopper of ideas, I had about 20, 20 or so things I was working on, and most of those were live action projects. So I thought, well, I'll go out there, come what may, feeling confident, I'll, I'll peddle a few projects around, see if anyone wants to buy them, and maybe I can get to write and direct a live action movie. And it, was, it probably took about two months. I, I polished up that project that got me a job at Disney in the first place, um, the Banshee and Finn McGee, the one that's set here in Kerry. And I took that out, and Disney, Disney bought it. Um, they also bought another project uh, called Sightings. And they told me that absolutely they wanted to make the Banshee right away. And so I had a little office in the old animation building on the Disney lot, and I started writing. We brought in storyboard artists. They started storyboarding. We brought in uh, producers and uh, a head of uh, fiscal production who started budgeting the whole thing. Suddenly we had a start date, and we had effects tests, and, and everything was sort of solid. We were starting to go out to our actors. And the whole thing was moving forward. We, had, we were going to begin, I think, six months later, starting shooting in the Ardmore Studios and out here on location. And I couldn't have felt more confident. Uh, so I knew the project. I could see it from beginning to end. And I knew that uh, I had the confidence of the studio. In fact, I was sitting around with all of these people who didn't know me, but they were, they were kind of the unit production manager and a few other f head of fiscal production, a few other people sitting at this table at this restaurant at Disney, and Dick Cook, who was the chairman of the studio, walked up and he said, this is exactly the kind of movie we need to be making right now. And so it was just imbued with so much confidence, uh, and I felt very good about it. And then, over the course of one weekend, Michael Eisner, who was the uh, CEO of Disney at the time, invited the live action development team to his ranch in Aspen. And he kind of surprised them by saying, uh, I don't normally insert myself in your business, but you made some terrible decisions last year. You made some big box office bombs, and I want to know everything that's on the runway um, because I want to either bless or, or nix <laughs> these ideas. And a development executive uh, started pitching Banshee. She got one line into it. She said, it's a ghost story set during the, the Irish famine in 1847. He said, nope. And that was it. Rooms of artwork, storyboards, budgets, film tests everything gone in the space of that. He said, nothing works in Ireland. <laughs> yep. And there was nothing we could do to resurrect it. He, had, he, had, he went there you know, to kill projects, and he did it. And despite doing rewrites, despite being rewritten, which was really demoralizing, uh, we couldn't get the project up again. And then eventually, he canned the president of production, and everything sort of went silent. So that was really demoralizing, like from a high to an absolute crash with nothing that I could really do to, to steer the ship. And the same thing then happened at Universal. I took a project that Disney had bought called Sightings. I, I sold it to Universal. And the guy who bought it was then ousted and replaced by someone else who didn't want anything to do with her predecessor's projects. And so I had spent about six years writing umpteen versions of both of these stories and watching them just eventually go on ice. And it's not for the project itself, it's more the politics surrounding it. So that was kind of a harsh wake-up call in the, in the world of, of live action. The one highlight in all of it was that, you know, one, very inspired by music in general, but particularly inspired by an Icelandic band called Hema, uh, sorry, called um, Sigaros, and they were trying to do a tour documentary I had approached them, uh, just sort of, kind of, uh, you know, the, the internet equivalent of a cold call. I searched their band management and introduced myself and said, I'm learning about live action filmmaking, in particular uh, music videos, and I would love to do something for your band. I think they're fantastic. And uh, they got in touch with me and they said, we're, we're touring America at the moment. We'll be playing the Hollywood Bowl in a few months. Stay in touch and I'll get you a meeting with the band. And, um, and true to their word, they did. It was very awkward. The guys pretended they didn't know English when they were <laughs> talking to me. And uh, 
I was pitching ideas for music videos they'd already decided that they were either not making or that they had an idea for. And it really went nowhere, but I was just excited to have met these heroes of mine. And then a few months later, I got contacted by the, the same uh, band manager who said, we tried to make a film. We got back footage that the, that the band doesn't like, and we're about to throw the whole thing away. Would you take a look at it? So I approached it from, he wasn't asking me to take it over. He just said, what would you do? What do you think? I said, well, as a fan who would buy this documentary, I would hope I'd get to know a little bit about, about them, about the tour, about Iceland itself, and sort of demystify a little bit at the same time, kind of protect the, the mystery of the music itself. And uh, anyway, he forwarded those email correspondences to the band, and they replied and said, well, he's, this guy's describing everything that we want anyway. Why not just hire him? And so I got a call. In the midst of all this disappointing news with the live action projects, uh, they said, could you fly over here to Iceland for two weeks and shoot everything you need and, and put the film together? And that, that became like a really rewarding experience in the midst, in the midst of all this demoralizing, uh, you know, budget-sucking uh, six years of, of my life. And when the film came out, it was something they were proud of, which was most important to me, but it also went on to become a success for them and one of Empire Magazine's top ten music documentaries ever. So that was a nice little highlight in the midst of all this. But, like, as I said, um, as finances were failing me and opportunities were drying up and I seemed to have gone cold in the world of filmmaking six years without producing anything, I got a call from Chris Sanders who had left Disney on bad terms with John Lasseter and had been working at DreamWorks on a project called The Crudes. And over the course of the weekend, uh, the boss there, Jeffrey Katzenberg, called him up and said, I want you to set Crudes aside and jump onto this movie called How to Train Your Dragon. It's in deep shit. <laughs> it, it has, uh, it's, we've wasted two years trying to adapt a book faithfully that's just not working out. We have a fixed release date, uh, just beyond a year from now, and it needs like a page one reconceive. And he, he said, I'll do it if my friend Dean's available. And sure enough, I was available because nothing was happening on the live action front. So it was a bit of a rescue line, and I don't know if it was fate or what, but it, it turned into a Hail Mary for the studio and ultimately a, a success that led to the, oh, the idea of doing a trilogy. So it was a really big, there were, there were lessons learned there as well about, you know, how do we take what we learned from Disney in that you know, sort of heartwarming, kind of classical, earnest qualities, and then apply them to the boldness of DreamWorks which in some cases had helped them, but in most cases it just sort of transpired into kind of glib, you know, pop culture referencing films that didn't really stick with you or didn't um, emote very much. Anyway, so I think we made a few bold choices that we wouldn't have been able to make at Disney, things like Hiccup losing his foot, and they were rewarded by the audience, and, and it turned into a, a, a critical and a financial success for DreamWorks. And they wanted to talk about doing more films. Uh, there was an immediate talk of doing a sequel, and I said um, that, that uh, maybe the best thing to do would be to do a trilogy so we could tell three acts of one story. And, uh, and that, was, that was embraced. And this was during a time when they had several successes. Uh, in the time that followed, uh, we started to waver in that. The studio started to waver because they, they had had several box office failures in a row. And with, with, um, with failure, box office failure anyway, anyway comes fear. And it started to become this atmosphere of fear and there was no risk taking anymore. And it became a lot harder to make a film like How to Train Your Dragon 2 where you have Toothless trying to kill Hiccup and his father steps in the way and takes the blast instead. That was heavily under fire, but I, I felt like I needed to put something into that, that that I really believed in and that I think was worthwhile doing. So. The studio was chasing its tail a bit. Um, there were lots of box office woes, and, but we, we continued our little success with the Dragon films, moving into the third film. In fact, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg had said something to Steven Spielberg, who would consult on the movie. Um, he said, of me, he said, I have the strength of his convictions, which was probably the best compliment I think Jeffrey Katzenberg ever gave me. So I still felt emboldened by um, our own tradition of pushing the limits within, 
within the Dragon series, even though the studio itself was really kind of cutting back on anything that was risk taking. So just to kind of fast forward to the end, because I want to get to some questions. Um, you know, it, it, with the third film, it's actually become harder than ever. And it's, it's interesting, it's like the environment changes. There are times when people feel confident and they want to take risks. There are times when they feel very cautious and they want to hold back. And this has certainly been a few years of holding back. The studio itself has changed leadership about five times on Dragon 3, and I've written lots of versions of this story. Um, but it actually came to a point where history was repeating itself, and I found myself last year, this time last year, um, with sitting in a room where the discussion was, should we bring in another writer and have it rewritten? And uh, that was just kind of my worst nightmare coming to be. And so I, with, with that on the table, and uh, one meeting with Guillermo del Toro, where he had read my script, and he said, he said, it, this just feels like a bunch of notes. It doesn't feel like a story itself. In fact, he was really graphic about it. He said, uh, he said, with the first movie and the second movie, he said, I could feel you fucking me. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, he said, with this script, I feel like you're trying to fuck me with a limp dick. <laughs> so, that's Guillermo del Toro for you. So anyway, I was inspired by that talk, and I, I, <laughs> I went back to, uh, to DreamWorks, and I said, I know what to do. Give me a month. Let me go write this in isolation. I said, I know what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I can see this again as a moviegoer. And I went away to write it, and I kind of sequestered myself away. I went to Skywalker Ranch and rented this little apartment and stayed there for a month and did nothing but rewrite the movie. And um, by the time I came back, I handed it off. I wasn't entirely sure, but I just want to read you. This is kind of like my little badge of honor that I, I keep with me. This was Steven Spielberg's response to having read that script. He said, insane congratulations. I cannot believe what I just read, and I had a problem reading the last part of it through my tears. It's a complete unqualified classic and better than the original. I've never witnessed this kind of transformation from the last two drafts I read to this one. I only wish I had points. Stephen, so. <laughs> Thank you. So now we just have to make it. So, <laughs> the uh, I guess the, the the big lesson is it never gets any easier, um, and. If you're, if you're committing to this as a career, know that you're always going to be, you're going to be a lifelong student, and you should, you should aspire to be. Because the moment you get soft or complacent is the moment you lose your touch. And it happens to our heroes, it happens to Spielberg, it happens to Ridley Scott. You know, you cannot get too cocky about it. Uh, story is a beast that will not be tamed. Uh, but the reward is, if you, if you do it right and you get to make projects, then you get to continue the cycle. You get to put stories out there that will inspire future generations. And that's kind of the coolest thing, you know. It was the, the films and the stories of my heroes that got me into this business, and I get to contribute stories that will hopefully bring future artists and storytellers into the mix. We all do, so I think that's the great reward of it all. So that said, um, there's a few minutes remaining. Do, you, do any of you have any questions that I can, yes? Did I choose Nico Marley to be our character designer? Um, he was part of the team when Chris Sanders and I joined, because uh, we came in quite late. We were the 11th hour of the original How to Train Your Dragon. And a lot of the characters had been designed. They'd been built. They'd been rigged. They'd even been used in several sequences that had been animated. But um, we came in with built sets and built characters that were really well designed and really well rigged. Uh, they just didn't have a story that worked with it. And so we reinvented the story, and with that came new characters like Toothless and the giant monster they defeat at the end, and a few, a few new sets. But uh, for the most part, we were lucky that, um, that Nico had been involved and that the character's designs were so good. And he's continued to work with us closely on the second and third film. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, I'm a first year in animation in, in Dunleary up in Dublin, and I'm just wondering, when you weren't working on animations or films, how did you keep yourself motivated or what did you do in between those times when you left Disney and it was six years before you worked on something yeah. else? Um, 
Well, I think I read, I, I read a lot of books on the craft, on screenwriting in particular. Um, the, one of the friends that I had made during that time was a guy named Blake Snyder. And so in the midst of all of this kind of uh, demoralizing and discouraging news with my projects, I met a guy who was really inspiring. He's written three books, actually four now, because they put a, together a collection of his blogs, and they're called Save the Cat. And it's, uh, he's, he was a working screenwriter. He passed away a few years ago. Working screenwriter who had put together all of these tips and techniques for other screenwriters to better their stories. And whereas people like Robert McKee, like the famous screenwriting gurus, um, have great things to say, but it can be a little textbook dense, um, Blake Snyder would provide like really usable, pragmatic tools and solutions to help with storytelling. And he used to do weekend seminars. I took a few of those, and we became friends. I, he asked me to be part of his personal writing team, a writing group, there were five of us. And, uh, and so I, I found inspiration in him even when things were demoralizing. And uh, I don't draw as often as I should, probably because I'm always surrounded by people who draw better. But I, I, I would try to do things that kept me creatively motivated. Music's a big part of that as well. I don't play, but I'm a big fan of. I spend a lot of time sort of uh, reading, listening to music, and coming up with stories that inspired me. Uh, yep. An effective pitch. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I would say "Pick Up, Save the Cat" by Blake Snyder. There's a section in there about you know distilling your story into a log line. The thing that I've learned about pitching is that you have to be concise because the person you're pitching to needs to remember the hook of your story so that they can report it to their boss. So the more you talk, the less clear that becomes. You know, If you can boil it down to two or three sentences and then ask, if they ask you to expand on it, that's one thing. But you want to be able to say, here it is in two sentences and have that two, two sentence, like you work forever on that thing because you, you want it to have the irony, the hook you know, who your character is, what they're up against, what's the question of the story, how does that relate to the theme? You know, within that two sentences you should know, is this a big budget film? Is it animated? Is it live action? What audience is it for? Is it a family film or a thriller? Like, it's all sort of baked in if you, if you do it really well. And that's, that's what I'd say, if you're gonna pitch, have a dynamite two, two sentence log line of the film, and then be ready to answer questions about, oh, tell me more, I wanna know about, more about this character, what's the world? Or, yeah, but uh, it's, it's a great book to read. It's really, it's, it's a fun read, it's light, and it's full of great information. It'll help you distill your, your, the essence of your story down to something that's digestible and memorable, which is most important. Anyone else? Yep, in the back. Uh, how would you know, uh, know which, like, which, our style of medium to write for? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite catch it all. Uh, how would you know what type of, like, which medium to write for? Like, should you write for animation or comics or live action? Uh, or what kind of art are you to do for your animated movies? Yeah, you're, so you're just at, talking about what medium to kind of yeah. choose for the story? Yeah. Well, I guess, in a way, it's how you imagine it. and. Maybe by um, maybe maybe if you know three people heard the same story told, they might see it in three different ways. But I tend to look at when I have an idea, I imagine like, is it does this feel like it'd be better grounded in live action, or is it whimsical enough and and imaginative enough that it would be better served in animation? And I don't really restrict it so much by I'm going to come up with an idea for animation as it is the idea itself, uh, kind of tends to whisper what it, what, what it wants to be. Yeah. And I haven't ever done, like I wanted to be a comic book artist, but I haven't done comic books and graphic novels. I'd love to one day. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, would you still like to do live action? Yes, I would. I would still love to do live action. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm determined to do that film, The Banshee here one day, and part of my, my strategy, my sort of quiet strategy is that uh, after the kind of fortuitous, very, you know, almost, almost a godsend of Dragon coming into my life at a time when I really needed a job, 
um, I then realize that if I complete this as a trilogy, it might give me clout out there if, if all three films are successful to unearth something that's kind of gone into stasis. So uh, they're, they're projects I still really believe in. That's one of them. It was the furthest along, so it might be the easiest to resurrect. And uh, others that are just outlines or you know a few lines scribbled or some stream of consciousness writing about ideas that I love. But that one was absolutely like fully formed and ready to go. <laughs> yes? I love what you said about having that uh, concise log line. Do you remember any of the, the, those couplets from any of the films that uh, we would, uh, that we've seen? Hmm. <laughs> Sorry. If, I wouldn't remember either, well, but I, I guess you might. Um, I, I'm going to wing it and probably blow it right here, but say How to Train Your Dragon is the story of uh, a tenacious uh, pipsqueak Viking and son of the chief who defies tradition by, um, instead of killing a dragon, befriending it, and thereby changing an age-old war and transforming his world. You know, something like that. You know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we got uh, one more minute, so maybe one more question. Anyone? Yes, over there. Um, you were talking a bit about taking risks in the medium. Uh, what risk do you think that screenwriters and people in the animation industry should be taking right now, given you know how far we've gone? Should be taking right now. Yeah. Yeah. Which risks would you like to see? Being oh taken? well. You know, I, I just think that there is so much that's created specifically for in animation for family markets that feels very safe and, and, and very familiar. That uh, I think with every project, no matter sort of how innocent the style or, or um, you know, what the budget is, how elaborate it is, I think there's always room to be a little bit, it's not subversive so much as it is just honest. Have something to say, like really believe in, in what you're doing and uh, you know, you've seen it in, in in films recently, like My Life is a Courgette, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it's deep, you know, it has a, there was something to say that kind of defies the simplicity, you know, and the sort of, the expectation for that audience. You think, oh, it's just for young kids, you know, some parents will end up watching it. But there's a way of imbuing these films with meaning and wonder and emotional resonance that that shouldn't, I, I just don't think they should be uh, swept aside. I think this is an opportunity to make your film memorable and indelible by touching people. And the best way to do that is to reference something of your own, something, some experience that you've had, something that you really believe in, and try to put it into the film. So it goes from beyond generic into something that really has a point of view. You know, that's a very general statement, but I think that it kind of falls upon all of you, the filmmakers, the storytellers, to find out what motivates you, what touches you, what, what experience in your past or, or some belief that you have for your future that you would love to imbue into your characters. It makes them real, and no matter what the style, no matter how simple, it makes it poignant, and that's important. Like, for just one last example, the. I remember sitting in front of a, a, an audience much like this um, opening weekend of How to Train Your Dragon 2, which came out on Father's Day. Uh, and in our story, as one audience member pointed out, why would you kill, why would you kill a dad and have the film come out on Father's Day? You know, and everyone sort of laughed, and yeah, it seemed really obvious. But my, my answer was that it's not a, gratuitous, not a gratuitous gesture at all. My father died when I was Hiccup's age. And to me, the story is about the celebration of parents and the heroism and the sacrifice they make. And so, you know, I was able to turn it a little bit in that sense because, yeah, it's, it's something that there's a part of the audience that will always hate you for killing a character that they love, but at the same time, if it doesn't mean something to you, then why are you doing it? You know, so that was just an opportunity to say, not only does it narratively work because Hiccup has to stand up and become the man his father was, 
and he will never do so so long as his father's standing right there next to him. That's one aspect of it. But the other aspect was I lived through it. So I know that some things are temporary and that lessons imbued uh, you know, through, through moments that don't seem very important at the time can be life-changing. And in the case of Hiccup, that is definitely the case. As we go into the third movie, we get to see everything that was sort of entrusted and, and imbued in him through experiences of his past turn him into the kind of character that he is. Anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate it.